Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Copa Rounds. Um, it, we are going to be receiving rounds today from Kelsey Brakel, Megan Clymans, and Gillian Shaw. <laughs> um, so I am Kelsey Brakel. I am going first. And I am going to hide the floating controls real quick. Okay, that's better. All right. Um, so our first case is Penny, an eight-year-old spayed female hound mix. Uh, the clinician sent us the left eye, um, and they told us that she presented five months ago with a blind left eye, mild boop thalamus, and lens subluxation. Um, they were able to maintain intraocular pressures at less than 35 until quite recently. Um, and then IOP got out of control and they elected to enucleate. The other eye is visual. Um, it also has lens subluxation and it also has glaucoma that has so far been responsive to treatment. Um, so uh, the globe itself, actually, uh, the gross photo is not incredibly interesting, but um, I think I, I want you to see it because it's not interesting. So uh, the cornea is here. We don't have the lens in this image. Um, Optic nerve is back here. Uh, this is iris, and then we have ciliary body. Um, and we have some of these like very sort of wispy kind of whitish material floating along um, the edges of the ciliary body plica. Um, and that's basically the only uh, lesion, if you can even call it a lesion that we have in this globe. Um, so remember these little wispy guys, and we will look at the slide. Um, oh, we'll do sub sub gross, even though there's not much to see. So, on sub gross, yeah, sure. Um, so on the left side of the screen, we've got the cornea, um, and then iris leaflets. The lens is obviously in the center. The retina is present. Um, this section, we don't have the optic nerve head. Um, if we really want to see it, we can go look at it. This is a deeper section because we're looking for something in particular. Um, but the globe on subgross looks just as quiet and boring as it did on the gross image. So there are really only a few things that I want you to see here. Um, Let's start by looking at the ciliary body plica um, because we were sort of, uh, it was the only thing we saw in gross. Um, so we've got this kind of wispy material that's slightly eosinophilic that you can imagine might have corresponded to what we saw um, grossly. And then in some places that wispy material is more condensed and kind of um, multifocally adhered to the ciliary body itself um, at the non-pigmented epithelium. Um, so places like here. Here, it's sort of floating out in space, quite wispy. Here, it's uh, much denser, thicker. And then it kind of blends with the ciliary body epithelium and it makes it difficult to determine where the epithelium starts and this material ends. Um, it's multifocal. It doesn't affect the entire ciliary body. Um, there's places like this where it's really hard to tell, oh dear, um, <laughs> where the epithelium ends and that material begins. Um, but then there's places like this where clearly the epithelium is unaffected. The other thing I wanted to show you, and this is extremely subtle, um, and you may or may not be convinced that it's true, but that's okay. Um, is, if we go closer, um, in the trabecular meshwork, um, in places kind of like this, we kind of have that same kind of homogenous, glassy to wispy eosinophilic material. Um, it's kind of taking up some space in the trabecular meshwork. Um, and that is essentially all that's happening in this globe. And so they describe lens subluxation um, and we want an explanation for that. The 
uh, sometimes it's nice to be able to explain it with a cataract. In this case, um, there really is no cataract. The lens looks really, really good. There is a little bit of posterior migration of the lens epithelium and a little bit of degeneration and liquefaction, liquefaction of posterior lens fibers, um, but it's only on the posterior aspect of the lens. Um, so in terms of cataracts, this is relatively unimpressive. Um, and then they also describe glaucoma. So we wanna check the retina. And it looks a little thin. And if we go more closely, um, the outer layers are still present. The inner layers seem to be going away. Um, the nerve fiber layer is a little bit difficult to make out. There aren't as many ganglion cells as we would like to see, AKA very few to no ganglion cells. <laughs> um, and then, like I said, we don't have the optic nerve in this section. In the section that we did have, um, the optic nerve had was not atrophic. Um, but we had enough loss of ganglion cells that we felt comfortable agreeing with their clinical diagnosis of glaucoma. Um, so before we go on, I actually want to show you another case that is not this um, to compare what was going on that ciliary plica um, with what we were thinking that this case was. So um, this is another beagle. Um, and this is a beagle that had zonular ligament dysplasia that we definitively diagnosed. Um, and in this case, it's it's much clearer. We've got this sort of homogeneous eosinophilic material that's very clearly tightly adhered to the ciliary body epithelium. Uh, once again, it's multifocal. It's not affecting the entire ciliary body. Um, but the areas where it is affected, it's pretty obvious. Um, so this is what we were hoping to see on the case that we had. We were hoping to see something really definitive and slam dunk. Um, but I just wanted to show you this so you would see what it was supposed to look like. <laughs> so um, we diagnosed suspected zonular ligament dysplasia with ZLD-like material in the trabecular meshwork. Um, we also agreed with their diagnosis of lens subluxation based on what we saw grossly. Um, we described a cataract and then we also described glaucoma. So the clinician wrote in their history that they were concerned about beagle type glaucoma, um, which we interpreted as uh, what's called primary open angle glaucoma, which has been reported in beagles as being related to an Adam TS10 mutation. Um, we also know that uh, terrier dogs and a bunch of other breeds get zonular ligament dysplasia with an Adam TS17 mutation. Um, we're starting to think that maybe there's some kind of relationship between an Adam TS10 mutation and ZLD, as well as an Adam TS10 mutation and primary open angle glaucoma. Um, but we don't have that super well elucidated at this point. Um, we do wonder in cases where we have lens subluxation um, and then development of glaucoma, if it's possible that maybe that material that we see in the trabecular meshwork might be contributing to uh, drainage problems and then resulting in glaucoma. But um, right now it's super speculative. Um, so it was an interesting case, uh, but a little bit mysterious. <laughs> Next one we have, no, oh, don't look. <laughs> um, we don't have a gross picture of this one. Um, Megan very helpfully gave us a bunch of eyeballs so that we can imagine what the gross picture might've looked like instead. Um, this is Hershey, the eight-year-old spade female Shih Tzu dog. We got the left globe. Um, the clinicians described, uh, a lot of corneal disease, hyphema, and then a scleral mass. Um, the dog has a history of heartworm, bronchitis, right heart enlargement, and atelectasis. So grossly, I will tell you what we saw. I'll paint you a word picture. Mm -hmm. um, so we saw the little nodule um, that they described on the sclera. We said that it was on the ventral limbus. The lens was posteriorly luxated. And uh, we said that the vitreous looked like a brown gel. And that obscured our view grossly of the retina and the optic nerve. So to go to the histo. Okay. 
All right. So cornea is on the left. I'm going to put the mouse in the middle because that's always more helpful. Cornea is on the left. Um, we can see that the globe is filled with uh, purple and pink as opposed to clear space like we want it to be. Um, this is iris here, which is kind of uh, far more cellular than we want it to be. And then uh, here is the limbal nodule that we described. And as you can see, it is not so much a nodule as a big hole. <laughs> um, and the big hole is bounded on either side by a lot of increased cellularity, which explains why it had a nodular appearance. Um, this iris is also hypercellular and thick. And then going back into the ciliary body, there's also a lot of increased cellularity. And then as we track along the retina, it almost seems like maybe there's an extra layer, um, which we will go look at more closely. And then once again, there's a lot of cellularity in the uh, vitreal space. And then right here in the middle, we have a really big lens. This is filthy. Wow, that's a dirty slide. All right. Going to the anterior. So we can see uh, even from 2X, the corneal disease that they described is pretty impressive. There's a lot of vascularity in here. There's a lot of cellularity. Um, there's a pretty significant keratitis. Uh, but what we're interested in is the big hole. So um, here is our increasedly cellular uh, iris leaflet. And on the other side, here's our big hole. Um, and it is definitely full thickness. There is some kind of proteinaceous exudate that's squeezing its way out of the globe into the world at large. Um, the iris is definitely more purple than we want to see. Um, and then we have all of the cellularity out in the limbus. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go closer and admire it. Okay, so this is actually a good spot to stop. Um, we're going to stop here for a minute. So we have kind of two populations of cells here. We've got these guys who are more epithelial looking, kind of cuboidal. Um, and then we've got all of this, um, which is more spindly. Um, so all of this is probably uh, fibrous connective tissue and a sciurus or desmoplastic response. Um, and then these guys are neoplastic epithelial cells. So this is a carcinoma. Um, I also want you to see this area up here um, because they are floating inside of a vessel, which is never good. So here's our vessel endothelial lining. Um, and then here's this nice little raft of cells that are floating on their own. Uh, this guy here has a mitotic figure. Whoop, all right. That guy there has a mitotic figure. Um, so these cells are, are uh, malignant and going places. So now we need to decide if they arose in the eye and they're leaving or if they came from somewhere else and they've arrived. Um, and one of the ways that you can help make that decision is by looking at the pattern of how they're spreading inside of the globe. So this is the retina. We've got our outer layers and then we've got our inner layers and then we've got our neoplastic layer. <laughs> uh, so going to look at that more closely. Um, it's actually really beautiful. Uh, so these cells are almost like uh, cuboidal to uh, columnar to pseudostratified. Um, we've got nuclei that are kind of basally oriented and then a very nice clear uh, border, which I never found cilia. I really wanted to. I was hoping that I would. I did not. Um, but it's this really striking sort of uh, carpet of neoplastic epithelial cells that is lining the retina. It lines a lot of other structures inside of this eye as well, um, which is a pretty characteristic pattern for metastatic neoplasia to the eye. Um, there are neoplastic cells floating throughout the vitreous. Um, and then obviously the neoplasm is invading into the uveal tract, uh, which explains all of that cellularity that we saw in the iris. And then it is causing erosion of the limbal sclera and then busting through right here um, as the sclera can't hold itself together anymore. All right. So in this case, we diagnosed a metastatic carcinoma with vascular invasion. Um, and then 
dribs and drabs of a lot of other things that are sort of secondary. We told them um, in our experience, metastatic carcinomas in dogs often come from the respiratory tract. They can also come from uh, mammary carcinomas that are metastatic. Um, obviously they can come from anywhere, but respiratory is pretty common in our experience. Um, and given that this dog has a history of a lot of respiratory disease, including heartworm and atelectasis of a lung lobe, and I forget what all else, um, it might be that that was masking kind of the other possible uh, pulmonary carcinoma or something like that. Um, okay, I am done and I'm gonna swap with Megan. <clears throat> All right, I'm Megan, and next up is Boots. Uh, this is a six-month-old uh, domestic long-haired cat of unspecified sex. Um, the only history that we had was microphthalmia of both eyes um, since birth, and we got both eyes. Um, the left eye is uh, the better one, so we'll look at the left eye today. Um, so here's our gross image. Um, and this one is really interesting because kind of the eye was sort of half affected and half less affected. So we can kind of compare the sides to help uh, point out what's going on. Um, you can see on the front view of the eye, um, looking in uh, through the cornea, um, there's part of the iris that seems well formed, but we still have these strands of iris-like tissue, these uh, pupillary membranes. Uh, that cross the pupil. And then this side of the iris is pretty awkwardly formed. It doesn't really look like the normal leaflet that we're used to seeing. Um, on the hemisected view, it's a similar deal. Um, we have the cornea up here on cut surface. Uh, on this side, you can see that nice well-delineated limbus and it transitions to sclera like it should. Um, you've got a nice well-formed iris leaflet here. So this all this probably corresponds to this side of the eye here. Um, it comes into the ciliary body, and then we have a nice well-formed tapetum back here, this nice sort of mint green tapetum. Um, but on this side, everything's totally different. Uh, we don't really have uh, a well sort of just formed discrete limbus. That limbal pigment kind of extends really far back. And then here we have something that looks like it's an iris leaflet, maybe, but it's all kind of crinkled up and funny looking. Um, the entire posterior segment is full of this white tissue. And then the back of the eye bulges out like this. Um, it's sort of partially filled by this white tissue, and then partially there's a big space here. Um, and then overall, the eye is small, the lens is small, and it looks like it has a cataract. Um, so uh, a very interesting gross presentation. Uh, we'll take a look at the hit. So the slide isn't perfect, but uh, it's a good example of some um, fun things to look at. So we'll take a look. So I can give you a quick subgross view, and we should probably switch over to this. There we go. Um, so actually, yeah, we'll set it up just like this because that's how it was in the gross view. So we have that little bit of cornea right here. Um, and that this side is kind of that more well-formed side. We do still have that nice well-formed iris leaflet. We have a nice well-formed pectinate ligament, reticular meshwork on the side. We still got a ciliary body, a nice pars plica. Um, and we've got this nice tapetum back here, which we'll look at uh, closer in a second. Um, but over here, the uveal tissue doesn't really start until way down here, despite the fact that the limbus with the conjunctival fornix is way up here more. And then we have this big bulging space at the back of the eye like that. Let's take a look at that all closer. Let's see. <laughs> so we've rotated the eye 90 degrees to the right. Um, so a closer view of what I was just talking about, how this side kind of looks well-formed like it should be, and then comparing it to that side, um, or the other side. So we've got this uh, conjunctival fornix here. The limbus sort of has that diagonal arrangement where the corneal stroma uh, sort of extends along the deep edge a little bit further than the scleral collagen does up here. That's how a limbus should look like. Um, we've got these nice well-formed pectinal ligaments. We've got a nice well-formed ciliary body. So hold that in your brain as we go over to the other side. On this side, uh, there's a bit of an artifactual gap, but uh, we have the um, conjunctival fornix way up here. And then this uh, corneal stroma-like um, tissue extends really far past that posteriorly. And the decimase membrane is sending that far posteriorly as well. So it's kind of a weird stretched out limbus 
Uh, the scleral venous plexus is a little bit hypoplastic and small looking. It doesn't seem sort of how it should be. And then the uveal tissue doesn't really start until way back here, comparing that to where the conjunctival fornix is way up there. And when we do see uveal tissue on this side, there's no real well-formed pectin uh, ligaments or trachular meshwork. It's just sort of this nubbin of kind of iris-like stroma. And then that transitions almost directly into um, pretty much no recognizable ciliary body stroma, just these kind of constipated looking pleca with not much else going on. And then there's barely anything that's sort of uveal at all. We just have this outpouching of the globe, the kind of more normal scleral collagen seems to end and we have this big outpouching. Um, that's basically just lined by a single layer of neuroepithelium. So it kind of is reminiscent of ciliary body epithelium, but it's just a single layer of neuroepithelial like tissue. And we follow it along. And eventually we get something right here that's kind of retina-like, um, but no distinct uh, and well-organized retinal layers. It's just sort of a glial scar or a little tag of sort of retinal-like tissue. Um, that's uh, outpouching is sort of interrupted by this big um, mesenchymal focus of tissue, which is that sort of white tissue we saw on gross view. Um, and on histologic view, it's got bone in it. So here's bone through here. It's got uh, fibrous tissue. It's got fibroblasts. On occasion, it has these little rests of kind of nervous-like tissue. They look like maybe astrocytes or something through there. So it's all this kind of disorganized um, mesenchymal tissue through there. Um, and then back up to this area, we've got the, a cataract. And before we move on from that side too, that there's that um, well-formed tapetum that we can see grossly as well with that green. So here's the tapetum, choroid tapetum from there to there. Um, so overall, this globe had a couple of congenital malformations. Um, the uh, anterior segment is kind of poorly formed on one side. And then this outpouching, which you probably all had in mind for this whole time, is uh, a coloboma. Um, it's pretty common to see colobomas back where the optic fissure would have been. Um, we didn't actually see a recognizable optic nerve in this case. It's basically all just kind of occupied by this coloboma. And then um, how the eye forms is at some point ectomesenchyme uh, kind of invades the optic cup. Um, and so we assume that a lot of this sort of disorganized mesenchymal tissue with the bone and, and things like that um, is probably just that uh, mesenchyme that's supposed to kind of come in and form the structures that we recognize is sort of getting lost and forming all sorts of funky stuff instead of the stuff that it was supposed to form. Um, so basically just a embryologic congenital malformation, a kind of constellation of findings like that, and a nice sort of um, better formed side to compare to, which was kind of neat. Um, so. Uh, let me go here. That's this case, um, basically just a uh, constellation of congenital malformations. Um, the other eye was fairly similar, just not as good of an example. Um, so uh, especially a good example of a coloboma, thought we would show that to you for eye embryology. That's it. Remember that bone can also form in the eye as a reactive change as well. Good point. So in this case, I think a congenital sort of development of bone in the eye is a good guess. But generally speaking, we can get reactive bone forming in the eye for various reasons. Very good point. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's worth noting uh, is that micro um, microphthalmia, uh, if you don't have a sort of well-established sclera in an eye, um, it can basically not expand to its normal size, um, in part because of colobomas like that or outpouchings like that. Um, probably also something worth uh, noting. We ended up calling this kind of microphthalmia with cyst. Um, you can actually get eyes where, um, because of a coloboma and a sort of cyst-like outpouching at the back of the eye, um, that the coloboma or the outpouching itself can be larger than the well-differentiated eye even. Um, somebody once described that as a double bubble type of an appearance. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, that's also something that's probably worth pointing out uh, as a nice feature of this case. Um, you need to establish that intraocular pressure to develop the normal size of the eye. Dr. D says in the chat, there is a relationship between microphthalmia and eyelid agenesis yes. uh, in cats in particular. Which is also a good thing to note because the other eye had eyelid dysplasia or eyelid agenesis. Basically, we caught some of the eyelid in section and it wasn't well formed. 
Yep. Yeah. All right. So a nice example of a couple of congenital things in that case. Uh, speaking of congenital issues, um, the next case is Cyrus, a one year, two month old French bulldog uh, male. Um, we have a possible history of trauma, which is interesting and important to note in this case. Um, in September of 2022, and this eye was enucleated in late December of the same year. Um, so that's important to keep uh, keep in mind. Um, but uh, otherwise, we had kind of some intraocular hemorrhage and some potential synechiae noted clinically. And the gross photo is very interesting. So on this hemisected view, we've got uh, cornea up here and the iris like we usually do. Here's the lens. And the lens has basically completely discolored this kind of red, brown, and sometimes even kind of orangish. Um, and those are basically the pigments of hemorrhage. We've got, you know, orange for hematoidins tends to out, be out, appears grossly, uh, brown for hemosiderin and red for blood. Um, so this whole lens is very hemorrhagic looking, which is very, very interesting. And part of the reason why I was like, oh, let's take a photo. Um, this retina is completely detached. As you can see, there's a little bit of hemorrhage in the vitreal space, uh, and there's kind of some thickening back here in the posterior lens. Uh, maybe if you squint and maybe somewhat use your imaginoscope, but we'll take a look at that histologically. Uh, I should also know that this dog is one year, two months old, and they say that the duration is approximately two months. Given that we're going to kind of get into some potential congenital stuff. So just to orient you, here's the cornea up here. And we're gonna start on the lens um, before we do anything else. There is posterior synechia and iris bombay. Um, you do see that this iris is fused to the anterior lens and thin and sort of anteriorly bowed. Um, but I'm gonna skip straight to the lens because I think it's the most interesting. Um, this lens is a pretty significant cataract going on. We would call it hypermature. Um, there's barely any recognizable lens fibers here. It's basically just a capsular bag full of liquefied lens protein. And that lens protein is admixed with abundant blood and blood products. It's pretty serious interlenticular hemorrhage. Um, these sort of uh, rhomboidal or polygonal looking uh, crystals, sort of red reddish crystals are probably hemoglobin crystals uh, over kind of in this area. Here we go. We have these pools of sort of fading degenerate looking erythrocytes, <laughs> kind of looking a little bit ghosty there. Um, they're surrounded by degenerate lens fibers and lens proteins. Um, and on the edges, we start to see some of our blood pigments coming in, some hemosiderin and hematoidin. Um, there are also some macrophages inside the lens admixing with all this stuff, which implies that somewhere there must be a capsular defect. So we'll go looking for that. Here's some more, there we go, there we go. Here's some more hemocytorin and hematoidin, very pretty, um, probably in macrophages. So what I'd like to do is take you over to this side of the lens and we'll follow the capsule on this side. So here we can make out some degenerate lens fibers. Here's the lens epithelium and the anterior lens, which is transitioning to the posterior. We've got posterior migration of that lens epithelium, which is part of the cataract. And we'll follow the posterior lens capsule here. And you can see that's very wrinkled. And as we track it along, here's more wrinkling. It's folded on itself. And then eventually it just sort of ends. Kind of got an end to it maybe right back here somewhere. And then the entire back of the lens represents this big defect where there isn't a recognizable capsule. And instead, this area is bridged by this very thick postlenticular membrane, um, sort of fibrovascular to fibrous membrane back here, all of this stuff from here to here. So that's what we've got. We've got a huge posterior lens defect with a postlenticular membrane. Um, we do have that retinal detachment. This is a good example of retinoschesis briefly. Um, so you see these sort of gaps multifocally between the nuclear layers, um, something that can happen when there's been traction on the retina or just as a result of chronic retinal detachment when it kind of sits detached like this. Um, so retinoschesis, an interesting lesion to point out. Um, so we've got intraocular hemorrhage. We've got um, significantly chronic intralenticular hemorrhage. 
uh, a large posterior lenticular defect and a postlenticular membrane um, in a young animal. So basically, in this case, we had two major differentials. Because in particular, there was a history of suspected trauma a couple of months prior to this presentation, um, we can't rule out that this dog had some sort of ocular trauma resulting in an acquired lens capsule rupture with intralenticular and intraocular hemorrhage. And then this is what we, we get. Um, however, this constellation of lesions is also somewhat common to see in dogs that have had a persistent fetal vasculature of some sort. Um, so usually for um, persistent fetal vasculature, we want to see this nice, delicate, sort of well-formed blood vessels in the back of the lens, um, which this case didn't really have, but sometimes it'll present like this with this really thick post-lenticular membrane, um, sometimes even with cartilage or other interesting things forming at the back of the lens. Um, and this really severe intralenticular hemorrhage is something that we often associate with persistent fetal vasculature as well. Um, this uh, persistent fetal vasculature can be um, basically a subclinical or incidental finding in some animals. Um, sometimes you can be a very old animal, relatively speaking, and have sort of have presented with this intermittent long-term hemorrhage into the eye and then sort of eventually develop neovascular glaucoma. There can be a, a pretty wide variability in the presentation uh, of what persistent fetal vasculature can do inside an eye. Um, and oftentimes it's result, it is associated with a congenital sort of incomplete closure of the lens vesicle. So the posterior uh, lenticular defect may have been basically an incomplete closure and complete formation congenitally. Um, so long story short, top differentials in this case, trauma or congenital malformation of the lens and persistent fetal vasculature. And it's kind of impossible to be sure or to tell histologically at this stage of disease. So here's that in writing. There you go. Um, and sort of drip and drabs of other things, as Kelsey would say. Um, but these are the main diagnoses that we would have. Um, that's about all. I think it would be really unusual to have trauma that would end up with that much very specific intralenticular hemorrhage. Yes. Personally, but what do I know? <laughs> you know a lot. Uh, definitely, I would agree. It's just hard to sort of be definitive about it, particularly when there is a history of uh, trauma. Although it's hard to say exactly what triggered the description in the clinical history of possible trauma. Did they say possible trauma because suddenly the eye developed hemorrhage and the owners were all like, oh, maybe he hit his eye. Could still just be fetal vasculature related hemorrhage. So, um, you know, hard to say. Uh, but yeah, the, the mo I, of those two differentials, I would say the more likely in this case would be persistent fetal vasculature and congenital malformations, which is part of the reason why we're showing this, this very cool case. Um, any other comments or things like that? And if not, I will hand the floor over to Gillian. Uh, Dr. Beckwith Cohen from Michigan State said, if you have grade six PPV, then trauma could cause more bleeding in the lens. Ah. Would be interesting if there was any fetal remnant in the other eye. Yeah, we always like to know what's in the other eye, but we rarely do. I don't think that they... All they described in the other eye clinically was gonioscopy showed an open angle and cleft. Uh, this dog also had a liver shunt, interesting in terms of congenital issues. Um, that's all I can say from history. Uh, all right, I will hand the floor over. French bulldog. Well, of course, it's a Frenchie. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about okay. All right. My turn. Let's see here. Okay. Um, next up is um a four-year-old pit bull mix, uh, neutered male. Um, we got quite a bit of detailed history, which is pretty nice. Um, they say multifocal pigmented iris masses in the left eye, which is this one, with mild uveitis, uh, pigmented flare to specify, and secondary glaucoma. The IOP was initially elevated in the low 30s and responded to dorsolamide and timolol to the low 20s, uh, then elevated again at 34. Um, this dog did have a superficial corneal ulcer, which was healed. Um, there's some superficial corneal pigment, episcleral pigment, uh, vitriol degeneration in the left eye. Um, they submitted eyelids with pigmented conjunctiva, third eyelid with pigmented conjunctiva, and two samples in a cassette that are sub or conjunctival slash subconjunctival 
uh, that was freckled with pigment. So they say, please evaluate the additional tissue with pigment for neoplasia. I was unable to remove all of the freckled tissue in the orbit. Um, thoracic radiographs were normal in December of 2022. Um, and so no evidence of metastasis. And the last juicy bit of information I'll save till the end. So um, here's a clinical photo of this dog. Um, the clinician was nice enough to share it with us. And so you can see that um, how dark the sclera is here. Um, and it's hard to say whether that's uh, sort of deeper pigment or more superficial. And also, I think you can kind of see there's pigment, what looks like in the anterior chamber up against the corneal or endothelium rather. Um, and then you can see there may be some darker spots um, on the iris. And then the conge is a little bit heavily pigmented on this side as well. So we got the globe and because of the nice clinical history, uh, we took a picture because otherwise um, it's not that remarkable, but here's the globe hemisected. Um, so right off the bat, you can hopefully appreciate that the iris, ciliary body, and choroid are all quite thick and solidly brown. Um, and then when you look around, there's maybe a little bit of speckling pigment out here in the sort of subconjunctival uh, tissue slash um, episclera. Um, and then the sclera itself is maybe not as crisply white as we would normally appreciate in most normal globes. Um, especially over here, you can see, I wonder if I could, anyway, my arrow is so blobby. Um, you can see that the sclera there is quite speckly and brown. There's also this uh, galaxy of asteroid bodies in the globe. Um, so there's asteroid hyalosis as well. So let's skip over to the slide. First, I will do this. Okay, I will remove Megan's slide. All right. So um, basically, um, I feel like we could get almost all of the important diagnoses from the gross photo, um, but not surprising, the um, the subgross looks pretty similar to what you might imagine from the subgross, from the gross photo rather. So the iris and ciliary body are thick and very brown, and there's also a lot of pigment uh, there in the sclera as well. I think here it's actually tracking, probably tracking along the veins of the scleral venous plexus. And as we follow around, that choroid is just way too thick and way too brown. So that's abnormal. And as we follow it around, similar story on the other side. Um, and remember that speckling that I showed in the sort of episcleral tissue, uh, we'll take a, a higher mag look at that as well. Um, the lens is otherwise kind of boring and I can't remember how affected. Um, the retina and optic nerve were somewhat unremarkable, even though there was a history of glaucoma. So, and I don't think we identified an area of previous corneal ulceration. So we'll start at the front. So there's always some pigment at the limbus, um, but this has a little bit extra pigment, uh, not surprising considering how extraly pigmented the rest of the eye is. Um, so in these cases, um, we have to decide whether the pigmented lesion that we're seeing in the uvea is neoplasia, i.e. some sort of melanocytic tumor, uh, versus uh, uveal melanosis, uh, which is a non-neoplastic proliferation of um, melanocytic cells in the uvea that often causes distortion, i.e. expansion, um, and often also occludes and sort of fills up and occludes the ciliary cleft and trabecular meshwork and therefore decreases aqueous humor outflow and leads to glaucoma. So to decide what, whether we're looking at a tumor or melanosis, first of all, we ask ourselves whether there's an actual mass. And in this case, um, there's sort of this diffuse expansion of the uveal tract by these cells. Um, so we don't really necessarily have a discrete, well-defined mass. The other question we ask ourselves is what does what is the morphology of the involved cells? So let's take a higher mag look. <clears throat> so cameras never like darkly pigmented tissue. So it all gets kind of weirdly distorted in green and pink and can't decide what it wants to do. But um, so what we do see is that uh, most of the cells in here, or maybe not most in this case, a lot of the cells are very loud, large and round uh, 
polygonal to, to uh, round cells. Wow, there we go. Uh, with distinct cell borders and a lot of very heavily pigmented cytoplasm. Um, so that's these guys. And you can't really see their nuclei. And then in the background, there are also some other pigmented cells that are more spindle to stellate shaped. So we have definitely sort of what we would call a double cell population, which is typically a buzzword or phrase that makes us think of a melanocytic tumor. However, in this case, we don't really have a discrete mass. Um, so um, in this case, we concluded that this was melanosis and not an actual melanocytoma, at least in the examined section. Um, that caused this diffuse expansion of the uh, uvea. Um, so melanosis, in, in melanosis and heavily pigmented eyes, there are often uh, melanocytic cell or melanin-containing cells out in the limbus and the limbal sclera, which is present here. And in this case, also, these cells are tracking along the um, veins of the scleral venous plexus but they're not actually in the lumen of the venous plexus. So um, they're just uh, alongside it and squishing the lumen, which might also contribute to decreased aqueous humor outflow and glaucoma. Um, so then we're gonna zip over to the other side. So there were some brown speckles in the gross photo up over here. And so we can see that there are some melanin-containing melanin cells alongside blood vessels um, in this sort of subconjunctival or substantia propria or episcleral tissue. So this is an increased number of melanocytic cells than would normally be expected uh, in the sort of the periocular connective tissue. And then um, the sclera itself also, and this here we're more in the equatorial sclera, but the equatorial sclera also has a larger number of these sort of fairly bland looking. And I, really at this mag, all you can say is that there's pigment there, but um, we just assume that it's inside of cells. So um, we have a lot of uh, melano melanocytes populating pretty much every single tissue that we've sampled in this eye. Um, there were slightly decreased numbers of retinal ganglion cells, uh, but the optic nerve head itself looks pretty normal. Um, at this mag, you can also appreciate the, how heavily pigmented the, the beams of the lamina cribrosa are. So there's really just tons of pigment everywhere. And then you can also see how much pigment there is uh, tracking along the optic nerve outside of the meninges and inside the meninges. Um, so um, basically what we have is a heavily pigmented eye um, with what we call uveal melanosis or that expansion and distortion of the uveal tract. Um, and then, um, there were other, um, tissues that were submitted that I don't have with me. Hmm. Well, anyway, um, so, uh, all of the pigment that the clinician was concerned with, uh, was all that sort of bland spindle shaped, um, melanocytic cells. Um, so we will switch back over to our PowerPoint now. Um, so basically here's the diagnosis, a heavily pigmented eye with diffuse atypical perivascular perineural and stromal pigmentation of the ocular, periocular, conjunctival, and orbital connective tissues, um, as well as uveal melanosis. So, um, all of that top stuff is, um, a differential diagnosis. The whole thing, the whole shebang put together is oculodermal melanocytosis, um, the globe also had asteroid hyalosis and chronic secondary glaucoma. So the extra bit of information that I didn't share with you that was provided to us was that this was a, a black slash brown dog, but the left half of the dog's head looks black, but the right half looks dark brown with a straight line at midline of difference in color. And I was like, wow, that's cool. And I asked the clinician if we could have a picture of the dog. And she said, yes. Um, so here is that dog. So you can really appreciate that. This is actually obviously post-nucleation, but brown, black dog. But here's this like very nicely defined midline line um, where the right half of the dog's head is brown and the left half is at least a darker brown, if not black. Um, so this is an interesting thing. Um, and we have, um, this has been reported before. And also um, we have received cases uh, described like this before as well. 
Um, so here's one of the um, publications about it. So ocular dermal melanocytosis. Uh, it's also called nevus of Oda in uh, human medicine. Um, but here's a really interesting example of a yellow Labrador puppy um, whose right side of the head is more uh, darkly pigmented than the left, which persisted into adulthood. Um, and then also this dog uh, developed uh, various uh, similar uh, pigmented lesions in um, that right eye. So similar melanocytosis. Um, I don't think they identified a mel melanocytoma in this eye, but also just uh, extreme pigmentation there. Um, and there's another uh, single case report in a Rhodesian Ridgeback of a similar thing where they show the dog as a puppy um, and then the dog is an adult with this very clearly defined um, heavily pigmented area over one of the eyes, one side of the head that also had uh, various pigmentary problems in that eye. Um, and in humans, um, here's an example of Nevis of Oda. Um, and so you can see the <clears throat> dark scleral pigmentation here, as well as some um, cutaneous pigmentation. Um, it also has this fascinating name in, in human medicine, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce. Um, and in this case, in humans, I don't think it's associated or very, very rarely associated with actual tumors. Um, and I don't think humans do uveal melanosis, or if they do, it's very rare. Um, I, I did find one mention that it can be associated with, um, I think, complications like glaucoma. So maybe it is sort of like a uveal melanosis sort of situation. Um, anyway, so I just thought that was a cool case. Um, this is uh, relatively rare. So is, is Neva Savota confined only to the head, or does it go along the entire length of the dog? Like the that bilateral pigmentary difference. Good question. I think it's just a head thing. Okay. And I think it's similar in people where it's just like the face that's affected. Um Do we have a doctor that has something that's just like Okay. What Actually, what <clears throat> is it shepherd? I was gonna say what flavor? Okay. There's a patient here at UW. That's a shepherd. Uh interesting. One of our is Patty's dog Kirsty. Yeah, Patty Kirsty, one of the people that was here. Is she the goat person? Never mind. I shouldn't ask that question. We're we're being recorded online. Never mind. Um, no, I don't think that's okay. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right. Interesting. Well, so we have a report of a German Shepherd here that has it. Uh, anyway, um, and in humans, it's um, more commonly found, and I think in Asian and African American or African origin folks. Um, so, um, sort of a bit of a. It has been shown. I think it's been reported in all races, but uh, yeah, so there we go. Interesting. So cool. All right. Uh, next up is um, a pot-bellied pig, which you can't read at the top there, but hopefully, oh, it's in the way. I don't know how to get that to go away. Uh, it keeps popping up because of the chat. Oh. You can go down and say hide floating meeting controls and it'll go away, but it'll, it'll okay. pop back whenever a chat comes Okay. Away. All right. Well, uh, so this is a two-year-old Vietnamese pot-bellied pig. Um, and the gross images might remind you of something that Dr. Kleiman said earlier, something about a double bubble. Um, but anyway, so this pig has an interesting history. So severe entropion in both eyes um, presented um, in August of 2021. Collagen was injected into the upper and lower eyelids and weight loss was recommended. So the pig was very overweight. Um, the regular DVM, the referring DVM, excuse me, did ritidectomy in fall of 2020. So about a year later, I had to Google that because I'd never heard that before. That's actually a facelift. Um, <laughs> and then in November of 2022, um, they reported complete conjunctivalization of the cornea of the left eye noted, which is this one, and a cyst-like structure seen on ocular ultrasound. Um, so they eventually decided to enucleate, um, and so they identified this cyst-like structure after enucleation. Um, the pig was apparently still overconditioned, or um, so. There we go. Um, so here's our double bubble of a globe. Um, here it is uh, before hemisection, and so I think the cornea is up over here somewhere. This is actually the cut end of the optic nerve facing up at us. And then here's that bubble-like structure at the back of the globe. Um, there is, uh, once we hemisected it, um, that uh, is also clearly a cyst-like structure um, that really is um, very closely associated with the optic nerve. So here's the optic nerve. We got a very long chunk of it, um, but we have that sort of defect in 
the sclera slash optic nerve head that then is communicating with that out pouching. So I'm only going to show you one of the slides, which was not the, well, anyway, it's, it's one of the slides. Uh, we actually had two, two sections submitted from this eye. Okay. And I have to switch over to the thing. Okay. So um, this is a peripheral section, and we know that because we don't have the pupil and we have the little ciliary body plica spanning across the posterior chamber there. The, the corneal segment that we're looking at is also quite short. So this is just a peripheral section, but it's also the one that displayed this lesion the best. So there's that hole in the back of the eye. Um, so the retina, you can see here, just sort of blends right into that tissue. And then here's the optic nerve over here. Sorry, I'm trying to focus in and out. Um, so you can see uh, that there's uh, a very thin walled out pouching of spiral collagen lined by some other kind of tissue that, woo, wow, uh, that we're going to just jump right in and look at a higher mag. So the front of the eye is pretty boring. Um, I did actually appreciate conjunctivalization of the ocular surface that they reported earlier. Um, the retina that's inside the globe looks pretty normal, actually, although I think there are decreased numbers of ganglion cells. Um, and then um, as we follow that into the outpouching, let's go to the other side, actually. So here's something that actually looks pretty identifiable as optic nerve head. Let's go down higher. Leading into, so here's the lamina cabrosa leading into the uh, optic nerve itself. And then we follow that back. And then it sort of leads into, so here's some of that scleral tunic. And we actually incised this globe to get it to fit in the cassette better. So it's all a little bit confusing in here. Let's go back over here. So here's more of that collagenous tunic. So a very thin sclera. And then here is some sort of uh, neural like tissue that's either retina or optic nerve. I'm not sure which it is, uh, but it's quite atrophied. Um, so what we have here is a huge defect in the optic nerve slash uh, posterior sclera. Um, so this is a gigantic optic nerve coloboma that led to this sort of cyst formation, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, there is some very minor uh, central retinal atrophy or uh, developmental um, absence or aplasia. Um, and then there weren't very many ganglion cells. They did not actually say whether this eye was blind, but I would sort of assume that it was. Uh, based on, well, the decreased numbers of ganglion cells. But the optic nerve itself actually looks pretty good, and presumably this did make its way all the way back to the to the brain. Um, so there's that uh, fabulous optic nerve coloboma. They um, said that they had injected collagen into the eyelids of this animal to help with the entropion, and they sent us a sample of that from the other eye. And if you wanted, ever wanted to know what that looked like histologically, um, so what we have here is the conjunctival surface, and here's the substantia propria. And so all of this sort of purplish, homogenous slash hyaline stuff is collagen. Um, presumably, they used a commercially available substance, like I think it's from bovines, actually. And it's interesting that it's purple, because I'm like, well, collagen should be pink. Why is it purple? But it's always this color. Um, so there you go. Um, Sometimes this works well, I think. Sometimes it eventually, or works well for a time, but sometimes I think it can sort of contract down and end up with the same problem that you started with. So, there we go. So optic nerve head and optic nerve coloboma was the main diagnosis in this case um, with that mild central retinal atrophy and there was some conjunctivitis. So there we go. Um, and I had Kelsey run up um, and, oh, yeah. We have a question. Yes. Um, Carol wants to know if she thought they injected hyaluronic acid. Oh, that's a good question. They claimed that it was collagen, <laughs> but it's possible that, yeah, that would make more sense for the appearance that it was hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. They gave a trade name, Elena. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> hyaluronic acid. Thank you for clarifying. No wonder it didn't look like collagen. Um, okay. All right, so I, I had Kelsey grab one more case because I thought we were gonna be a little bit short here. 
So last up here is um, tissue from a dog from Utah, uh, periocular tissue. So they actually described nodules um, uh, around, I think the episclera or subconjunctival tissue of both eyes of a dog. I think it was a young dog. I don't remember the breed or the age or anything like that. But the dog is from Utah, which to give you a clue about what uh, we're talking about. I don't have a gross photo because we got little bits of tissue, which we never take pictures of because um, they're boring grossly. Uh, so I'm just going to jump right into the histo. Yeah, just imagine a tiny pink nub of tissue. Yeah. There you go. You know what it yeah. looks like. <laughs> so um, uh, at this relatively low magnification, I hope you can appreciate that there's lots of fun things happening in this tissue. Um, basically, we have a collagenous connective tissue that uh, contains or has embedded numerous organisms. These organisms are linear. Um, so we're catching them in longitudinal section occasionally, but mostly in cross section. Um, they have a cuticle. And they have some internal organs. Uh, the cuticle, um, especially in the cross section of the worms, oh, sorry, they're worms, there you go. <laughs> Um, have uh, cu the cuticle has cuticular ridges, uh, which are annular, which is important for the identification of this creature. Um, and then uh, they are adults, and we know that because they have reproductive structures in them with tiny baby worms and other things, which I don't know what those are. Somebody else can probably chime in. Um, I should know all of these words for what we're looking at here, but this is some, some of the musculature uh, inside of this worm. And then we also have a pseudocelome which tells us that it is a nematode parasite and not a uh, trematode or a uh, tapeworm of some sort, because um, those types of worms do not have uh, pseudocelomes. Um, so this dog is from the perfect area from the Southwest United States, um, in Utah in particular, um, but also this occurs in Arizona and maybe New Mexico, some other areas right down there. So. These parasites are um, Oncocerca worms, uh, probably Oncocerca lupi, but we don't know what the species is actually. Um, this is a parasite that uh, likes to live in the conge of dogs. Um, it can also affect people. It is spread by some sort of fly, I believe, um, that likes to um, feed on eye secretions of canines um, and probably deposits the worms, uh, the little baby worms that then grow up, I think, unless this is a different life cycle. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's like a direct contact kind of cycle as opposed to like something that migrates from somewhere else in the body. Um, but, and let's see here. So that's just a cool case. Uh, so both eyes had them. It often will elicit a sort of granulomatous lymphoplasmacytic eosinophilic response, um, which is most prominent when the, the nematodes die. Um, and sometimes that can happen just because of the life cycle of the, the worm or because it's been treated with um, ivermectin or something like that. So this one has much more of a chronic sort of lymphoplasmacytic and granulomatous inflammation scattered about. Um, sometimes we only get little uh, nodules of inflammation um, with or without uh, remnants of dead parasites. Um, like for example, this guy floating out in space right here is um, probably an inviable parasite uh, because it doesn't have any more internal organs anymore. Um, and so sometimes we'll just get remnants of dead parasites. Sometimes it's just mineral, but we put two and two together with the geographic location of the patient and the type of inflammation. And hopefully we find some evidence of uh, parasite parts. And then we say, this is probably Oncocerca. Okay. So that's all we have for today. Um, thank you for your um, uh, attention. And I hope you have a lovely Wednesday, everyone. And we'll see you again in two weeks.